This is quite a challenge to actually uh, get up here after two actual smart guys and one of them with a fancy presentation. Uh, I'm just the entrepreneur. Uh, so I build stuff, but I don't really know what I'm doing. So I'm thinking instead of me trying to be clever, I'll just tell you some more stories for how this to be uh, the guy starting a company. Um, I was in Portugal a year ago. Uh, I had a really good experience uh, of seeing sort of the energy around here with the times that it actually is. But there's a lot of young people that want to do stuff. That's really cool. And uh, it kind of reminds me of my, my early days. I think I had my best idea when I was 15. I worked in a gas station. And uh, I was, as everybody else, you know, putting coke into the fridge every night. And what happens with students putting coats into a fridge is that always put the new coats in the front, which means that the old ones is in the back, and you have to throw 50% out of all the coats in the fridge. And there was another survey that said, like, if actually the, the coats was like at the front of the fridge, people would buy more, more coats. So one night I was standing there alone, I, I come from a very, very small town. There was, you know, only that one guy which, which uh, wife was working that night and he went in to buy like one of those adult movies and that was kind of what happened uh, one of those nights so, so you know whatever I was thinking about how could we actually change this, this situation with this fridge so I came up with this idea of, of building a shelf system where you can actually load the fridge from the front and the shelf was like on an angle so all the all the coats they were you know in the front of the fridge I went to a friend and we kind of built this whole thing up and I got a, sort of a, a business plan around it. It was not hard to calculate that there's a lot of coke fridges in the world. Uh, and you know, it, it's kind of a good business plan, right? You know, you save 50% that, that was waste, and people buy 10% more if you do this. It's, it's, it's pretty decent sort of uh, business. So this is uh, way before there was like startup incubators everywhere. And, you know, you can go everywhere to, to sort of get help. But I found uh, one. Uh, innovation center, whatever it's called in a, in a bigger city in, in Denmark. And I sent to my plan and said, like, this is really great, we would love to help you. Uh, we can put it in production, it's only about, you know, 100 to 150,000 euros, uh, and we can get started next month. I was 15 years old, I spent all my money on girls and booze, uh, <laughs> and there was, there was not like 100,000 euros for anything like a startup. So unfortunately, I didn't do it. Today I regret it uh, for two reasons. I don't know if I ever could have made my shelf system, but for two reasons. One is that when I later started building companies, I would have loved to have that experience and not giving up before I actually tried doing my startup. Uh, I gave up where most people give up building their startups on their couch. Um, the second reason is that you all know that these Coke fridges have this uh, shelf, so every time I buy a Coke to them, like, I could have sold that. <laughs> um, anyway, seven years later, or something like that, I was finishing university, and uh, I had the choice that every student has, like, what should I do with my life? Should I, in my case, should I go get a job, or should I start a company? This is in 2007, so it's relatively easy to get a, a job as a student. So I walked around asking my family, my friends, and everybody I knew what I should do. And uh, it really didn't give me an answer because it gave me a lot of answers. Basically the answer that everybody would have done themselves. Uh, so one night I was sitting in my kitchen, I remember this because I lived in my friend's girlfriend's apartment. Uh, it sounds weird, I know. Uh, but she painted her kitchen pink, I don't know why it was ugly. Uh, but I remember sitting in this pink kitchen one night and then thinking the only person you haven't asked this question is actually yourself. And after three months of deleting emails about job applications and jobs and whatever events there were around jobs and spending all my nights thinking about building startups, I was like, there is only one answer to this question. I have to build a startup. So the next day I started my uh, first startup. Actually, I started two. That was a mistake, so never do that. Um, I started with my good friend. We, uh, my first startup was a children's furniture. That's also a bad idea. Um, 
What happened to that was that uh, about half a year in, the largest uh, furniture manufacturer of that kind of furniture in Europe came to us and wanted to buy the, the, uh, the concept. It was a designer that used to be a friend of mine uh, that had done the concept and me and my business partner, we went in as sort of the commercial guys and helped this guy sort of getting it off the ground. The day before we had to go and sort of discuss the, the sale of the thing, the designer called us up and said, you know, guys, I like working with you, but I'll take it on my own from now on. That's a bit of a bummer, right? Um, so that teaches you the first rule of business, that business is business, and you need to treat it like a business and sign contracts and whatever else there is uh, in this world. Uh, he's not necessarily a good friend of mine anymore, uh, <laughs> but I do know that he never got the thing sold, uh, and maybe because the combination of uh, you know, very creative and someone that could actually execute was not there anymore. My second company was a, a student media. Um, we, we started in 2008, spring. We went out in the beta version, went really well. Um, we took it down, got investment, got some new uh, software company to help us build it. And then we relaunched it in the fall of 2008. And if anyone remembers history, this company was based on job advertisement. It was a hell of a lot easier selling job advertisements in the spring of 2008 than in the fall of 2008. The other bad thing we did was that the software company was owned by an Icelandic company, which was also a bad idea in the fall of 2008. Um, so the second learning from my, my second failure, or third of, I don't know how many I've done, but one of them <laughs> was about timing. So two things about timing. You know, one was the obvious one, the, the financial crisis. Could we have foreseen that? Yes, maybe, maybe no. But the important lesson about timing was that this company, so what we did, we provided free printing for students. We basically built like a Google AdWords offline. So we, we provided free printing for students by utilizing the real side of the page as like a job advertisement, but obviously based on who you are and you, know, you sign up for the service and stuff. So, so the real timing issue in this was not the financial crisis. The real timing issue was we were doing something where we were fighting against the waves. We were basically the, the surfers swimming out uh, instead of the ones sort of surfing the wave in. Everything else was going online. Everything else was going global. Everything else was going against what we were doing. Uh, it's easy to, to you know, figure out that we were stupid. Now, but at that point we obviously didn't. I still think the idea was good. Was good. We should have just done it like five, seven years before. Then it would probably be in a, a rel relatively profitable business. So whenever you're looking at building your startup, you need to look at the timing, as in what can help you drive uh, this thing uh, forward without you doing anything. Um, okay. Uh, my next company was a toy company. I don't. I have no idea why I get into all this kids thing. I'm like, uh, I barely have art, but, but I, at least I don't have kids. Uh, so anyways, um, we, we got off the ground. My, my vision around that company was that I wanted to teach kids commerce, which I think is one of the biggest flaws around. Uh, so I wanted to build a platform for toys where you could buy new and sell uh, used toys, and basically kids could have their own like toy store. They all have 200 pieces of toys in their room. And if I could teach a kid that you can, you can sell or swap two pieces of used toys and get one new one, uh, that, would, that would be good. But the team wasn't there uh, from, for multiple reasons. So, so third lesson for me, like you need to have the right team that have the right commitment, the right commitment together. Um, then I... Uh, started a company called Polio. Uh, how many here know about Polio? <sighs> Not as many as present. That's good, I'll be back next year, and then all of you go like this. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so, so that's actually what I came to talk to you about today. Uh, I'll, I'll do it quick, um, uh, as, as quick as I can. Oh, this is a bit tricky. Uh, <laughs> I, I was actually supposed to show this slide before. I think this one is sort of my favorite, and it's definitely saying a lot about what, what I've been doing. That sort of the 
cumulative being as you know is that you need to take a lot of decisions, you need to take it fast, which means that you'll fail faster than a lot of uh, your friends, which is a good thing. Uh, and there's definitely a lot of good decisions that I'm making now that I do because I made a hell of a lot of bad ones, but I dare to do it quite fast. So, so don't be afraid of, of going out there. Uh, at least I haven't been killed by it yet. Um, after all these companies, uh, there was three guys in the basement next to ours, or my the company that didn't work out. They uh, asked me if they wanted to join the founding team of something called Podio. They wanted to build the platform for work like Facebook is for your social life. They wanted to empower the individual end users to build their own uh, not software, but build their own work tool. Uh, and their competitors uh, was Microsoft, Google, Salesforce, whatever uh, you, you name it. Uh, I don't know how it is in Portugal, but when you are four guys in the basement in Copenhagen claiming you're going to outcompete uh, uh, Microsoft, Google, Salesforce, and whatever they're called, the, the single most sort of uh, uh, what do I say like the, 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 the advice you get is you are fucking stupid, stop this idea. Um, so so that, that's a good motivation, but then you need your then you know you're sort of onto something. Um, but one thing that I think has been the thing about Podio all the time is that we we always had a vision behind this. We always was about the users. This is my co-founder John. We spent 25 euros on this poster, which was like weekly budget at the time. Uh, the poster reads, the power to manage work is back where it originated, with the people doing the job. This was sort of our vision, this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to get people out of those tools built by other people, built by the IC department. Strong tools that's not built for the users actually using them. We wanted to build a tool that was built by the experts. The people actually doing the job, and that's still what we are doing today. Uh, and I still talk about this poster, even though it's I don't know, four years, three years old. Um, and then you need to believe in it. This is how it looks like. So you 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 kind of understand people that question whether this can be the new Microsoft, right? Um, so so you know, there's there's also something about sticking to that vision, to that poster, whatever you 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 want to do. Um, I was the CEO and we needed to scale the company, um, so we needed an investor and we got a guy called Tommy, he did a, another startup before, sold it to Vodafone and, and, and wanted to do something again, um, so we actually agreed that he should be the CEO. Quite a few of my friends questioned that decision, is that like, why do you want to give up like the seat of being a CEO? Um, and it comes back to basically what uh, you started off saying that those that sort of find better people than themselves, right? Tommy was a better CEO on Polio. He still is. And, and to be, like, now he's not here, like being a CEO, raising funds can sometimes be a little bit annoying. And so I was kind of happy that he could deal with all the finances and I could deal with all the users. But don't tell him that. Uh, he paid like half a million euros to get the seat, so, so you know. Well, uh, he got in and then we started hiring a lot of people. And I can only second that thing, like finding the best people on the team is the key most important thing. Our company got sold a year ago for a lot of money. If you were to buy the actual value of the assets in Podio, there was uh, 30 used laptops uh, and uh, you know, an office where I bought all the furniture second hand. Uh, so, you know, we are talking 10, 20,000 euros of actual value. The rest of the value in Podio was what's in the head of those 30 people that sold the company. Uh, I know that's a bit too black and white, but it is really the people that makes a difference, right? So, we are 15 different nationalities in, in Copenhagen. Uh, all of them, uh, a lot of those people moved country to come work for Podio. Not because they couldn't find a job anywhere, not because they couldn't go out and get more uh, salary in other, don't tell them that either, uh, uh, in other places, but because they've been 
believed in that poster, because we believed in that vision, because they wanted to change how people work with us. Uh, and that's what we are looking for. We're not looking for the guy that can't find a job. He won't change the business. He won't change the world with you. You need the best one. We won the uh, uh, best enterprise startup of the year uh, for the Tech Crunch Europas. Uh, 40,000 votes on, 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 and you know, we, we, we became this one. So happy, happy team. Uh, we're very proud of that. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna, you know, this is super obvious. I think, you know, we're building software, but we're building it for people, right? I think a lot of, it's, it's people that are viral, it's not products that are viral. It's, you know, what you can do with people. So I totally agree with, with you on, you know, everything is, is about people. Um, this one is when we launched Podio. So we were kind of a bit slower. The joke in, in Denmark is that we have launched Podio about four times. We do it every year. Uh, but this one was like the real one. Uh, this was the day that you could, you could uh, go online and, 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 and you know, get Podio for free. Uh, so we were sitting in Copenhagen thinking, you know, well, how should we launch Podio? Where should we launch Podio? We don't want to do it in Copenhagen. It's kind of, you know, it would be easy. Uh, but it's too like home, it's too small, you know, the ambition was much larger than just doing it in Copenhagen, we were thinking London, we were thinking New York, we were thinking San Francisco, we decided on San Francisco. So me and my co-founder John, we, we went to South by, uh, this is actually quite exactly two years, three years ago, two years ago, 11, March 24th of them. Um, we came to San Francisco. Uh, I had been there once before on holiday for a week. John had never been to San Francisco. We rented this old gallery, and uh, we, you know, Podio. We built users built apps on Podio, uh, and we obviously have an app store in the product. So we always wanted to build like a physical app store. This is another stupid idea as a software company because it's fairly hard to put your product on the shelves. But the idea about this whole people thing that we built it for the people, therefore we want a small retail store where you can walk in from the street and we'll help you build the apps on Podio, we'll help you sort of get set up and, you know, kind of Apple store-ish thing. So, we get this, we get this place to San Francisco, we go to San Francisco, we come there, we had like a PI agency. Rule number one, never hire a PI agency, it's absolutely terrible. Um, anyway, so we get to San Francisco, the first thing they say is like, uh, sorry, we haven't done anything and we quit. Okay. Uh, the other thing uh, was like, uh, we asked the guy owning the place, like, is there any internet? Yeah, no. Okay. Two days from launch, no internet, no nothing, no furniture, all like empty room. Then, then you kind of have to get your entrepreneurial like, spirit going, right? Yeah. So uh, we did the only thing we knew, uh, rented a big truck and went to IKEA. <laughs> 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 and then. Uh, in San Francisco, they have all these amazing services for whatever you need. One of them is called TaskRabbit. It's basically like you know, black label, we would call it in Denmark, but in San Francisco, it has some fancy label. But we hired a guy for two days, he only assembled IKEA furniture for two days. Um, and we had another guy, this is also San Francisco, that could do this like satellite internet. He was sitting on the roof and like fixing satellite for us in the pouring rain. And you know, we lost the whole thing. But we got it all ready. Uh, this was the day of launch. We had 400 people there lining up in the street to get into this shitty little Danish startup coming to San Francisco. This is the same week where the phone app Color got I don't know how many millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, on a PowerPoint presentation, right? So this is what you are fighting against when you are small and come to San Francisco. But what this shop did was that it enabled everybody to come to us instead of us walking around to all the journalists. So we got a lot of press on the actual shop, the actual idea around doing a launch differently. And then obviously when we launched, everybody had to come and see what, what the heck is this podium thing. Um, and then of course rule number two, every good startup had a good rock band. Uh, that's just like, that's how it is. Uh, obviously we have a band called the Podiums. Uh, we call them up like the week before, it's like, Anas, you need to play on Thursday, but we're playing San Francisco, there's a plane, get over here. So uh, then we bribe all the neighbors because we knew about America and they're sort of liability, they're, they're a little bit, um, 
they're not so European in partying over that. Um, so we sent all the neighbors on a hotel and then we kept the party open until 3 o'clock and there's still people in San Francisco who remember this because it's like doing things very different. We actually didn't know that we were doing it that different, but, but the party part of it was uh, apparently quite different. Um, so what happens after that, that is like, okay, this is only meant as a launch, but we kind of wanted to launch an, a, a, an office in San Francisco. Uh, but you don't go home after this one. You know, we had momentum, we had a lot of people sort of, you know, looking at this polio thing. So uh, I had a student worker working for us, and, and I asked questions like, is it possible that you could stay around for like a week-ish? <coughs> And uh, he could, and then it's like, okay, that's good, can you then uh, drive down to bed and beyond, and, like uh, buy three mattresses and whatever you know, we need for sleeping. Uh, and then we put that up in like the back room of the office, and I called my mom and said, like, mom, I live in the US now. Um, I actually did. Uh, and then we kind of figured out all the visa stuff and all that shit afterwards. But uh, that, that wasn't easy, and then, you know, it's, again, you know, don't take any advice from me today, this is like, the book of how not to lose life. Um, but then we, we, we got you know, the whole thing going. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to say, but this time is kind of obvious. Uh, a year later, we got acquired by Citrix. <coughs> um, I can go into a lot of details around getting acquired. I think it's, uh, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of decisions, there's a lot of motivations for getting acquired that seems either black and white from the outside but maybe not always black and white from the inside but the truth is we we didn't build a company to flip it uh, i mean we got we got acquired quite early in this in the life of polio but the initial the ironic part is that i don't we didn't build a company to get sold we built a company to build a real company that had real revenue and had a platform and not just like a single purpose thing. Uh, we did all that, but I think the reason why we got acquired was because we were solid, we were a platform, we did have revenue, we did have a brand, we did have a lot of these things that, that, that you just don't like get rid of. Uh, now being part of Citrix, the whole strategy around this Citrix had a lot of these um, some more single purpose uh, products uh, in the online division, so Gold Meeting, Gold Webinar, uh, share files, file sharing service, but they didn't have that thing that could connect them all. So Podio is the thing that could connect Citrix, so I'm still working on that poster. Uh, seriously. Uh, and now I'm just working a little bit more internally, because that's what happens when you get acquired, like 80% of your day is like discussing internal matters, and 20% is the rest, unfortunately. Uh, but the plan is to make Podio the center of everything Citrix on live, uh, which is a good case. This is uh, Mark Templeton to the right, CEO of Citrix, Tommy, our CEO, uh, on stage in uh, uh, Citrix Synergy presenting this. This is the same stage as Steve Jobs uh, launched the, the iPhone, and it's like 6,000 people there. And, you know, it's quite, a, it's quite a good day. We brought the whole team to San Francisco again, and uh, everybody was sitting around. And, and, and seeing all the pluses. So, coming back to the team, for me, the, the biggest events in the podio story has been the launch and this and some of these places where you can see that those people that worked their ass off, those people that believed in that poster and that vision, uh, they were very, very proud of what they had accomplished. Uh, and that, that kind of makes, makes me proud. Oh, um, anyway, funny picture. I, I needed something for my presentation as well. <laughs> I was talking about a little bit about Copenhagen, but I'm running out of time and no Lars is coming on later, so I think he will address uh, you know, Then talk to Lars about the community in Copenhagen. Uh, I think it's getting more connected. Uh, I have been spending the last two years in San Francisco. Nowadays I fly back and forth every two weeks. That's not recommendable either. Um, <laughs> So I've seen both of them. I think when I speak to Danish entrepreneurs, it's like they rather go to some other Danish city to take like a customer meeting, which is like the train ride is longer and it's more expensive to, than taking the flight to Berlin or Paris or London. 
I think we have the beauty of Europe, even though you guys are maybe a little bit sort of, you know, on the end of it. Uh, we're still physically connected to the rest, and, uh, and I mean, it's a fairly, fairly easy, easy plane ride to go to Paris, to Madrid, to London, to Copenhagen, to Berlin. Uh, and I think that's what we need to get going. We will not build a new Silicon Valley in, in, terms of, uh, in Europe uh, for the simple reason that nobody will be able to agree where it should be. Um, and even if they did, that's not, not Europe, right? But we do have a lot of connections, and I do see all these hubs and all these initiatives making everything more connected. So, so please use it. And then my final thing is that I think there's too many entrepreneurs wasting their talent, which is not only what they learned in school, but also the fact that they're born in a time and an age where you are born with these things, you understand social, you understand the web, you understand how transformation of things work, and then you build yet another uh, social, real-time, location-based iPhone app, instead of fixing real problems and real matters. And it's not that we're short of problems in this world. There's lots of things that you can do. So my only thing is, like, please do something that matters. It can be something that matters to you, to your family, to your friends, to the world, whatever, but do something that matters. Uh, and then go build some business. You can go build up uh, Portugal. Thank you. And then his boss called him like 
should this guy actually be paying you know off his debt? And he gets called and it's like my boss is telling me you need to like pay a little bit. Like I told him like yes, there's two scenarios: either you never get the money, or get them in one go. And uh, oh, okay, fine. And, you know, yeah, we got got them all back. So he said no. That was one guy that had a microphone so Yeah. Uh, I'll just a small and known company in the basement in Denmark that uh, can track the best people which you got to find Microsoft and Salesforce and the like. No, I do believe that 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 good people that are passionate about building something, they are also passionate about believing in something. And uh, even though it's a small company in, in Copenhagen, we managed to get uh, the initial sort of angel investor was a guy so quite well connected in the Danish uh, scene. He helped us quite a lot. Tommy got on board, uh, the, 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 the CEO, uh, which had a, had a good name in, in Denmark and also in Europe. Uh, and then you get uh, our next hire was our CTO, Phil. He was the former CTO of Quite. I don't know if you know about the European version of Phil. Uh, and former CTO of something called Gumtree in the UK. Um, and he was looking for like a, the new big thing, right? And uh, he, he believed in this. I think it's, you know, you are, you are always selling, right? A job interview in a startup is not the, the applicant selling himself, it's you selling your company. Otherwise, you're taking someone that's not doing um, So it's hard work just like getting a business. I, I am way over time, I think. Sorry. I hope you like it.